Uh, well, if you've been with us for any length of time, you know we read a lot of prayers together, uh, that there are a lot of things that we say together out loud. And one of those things is the confession prayer. We say it at the end of every service. And in that prayer, we talk about confessing our sins, right? The things that we have done in both thought, word, and deed, things that we have left undone, and those that we have done. We talk about not loving God with our whole heart, not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We repent together, right? So that we can delight in God's will and walk in his ways. And, you know, many of times I've heard people ask, or I just assume that they wonder, uh, isn't it wrong to make everyone say that? <laughs> isn't it wrong to make everyone say that confession prayer? And first of all, I just want to say, we are not forcing you to pray any prayer ever here, okay? So if you choose willingly not to engage, that is fine. That is your choice. Uh, but we do recite the confession prayer. We do that week in and week out because we believe that the practice is important and the practice is worthwhile. If you think really critically, though, about this prayer, its implications are kind of severe, because if we recite this prayer week in and week out, right, we are saying that every single one of us at some point that week, at some point today, at some point this month has sinned. The Lord's Prayer similarly has this implication, right? As Jesus instructs us to regularly pray and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Uh, if you grew up in church, you probably were taught in Sunday school, right, that you were a sinner in need of forgiveness. That became some common vocabulary or vernacular in your upbringing, but if we, for, for just a moment, were to suspend what we're supposed to do, what we ought to do, what we're told we're supposed to say, some of us, myself included, may sit here and think, am I really a sinner? Am I really that bad? Like, I haven't murdered anyone recently. I haven't stolen anything. I haven't cheated on my partner. Am I really a sinner in need of forgiveness? And it's not just you. I think a lot of people in our culture today have this prevailing ideology of not that bad, right? I'm just not, I'm not that bad. And whether that's you or not today, this ideology does reveal two very interesting things. One, that we have a hope for humanity, right? That we have the ability to see good things, not only in ourselves, but in other people. But it also reveals a bit of a flaw in our world order. And that is the inability to ever admit that we failed or to ever admit that somebody else has failed us, right? Let's keep things nice. Let's be Midwest nice, right? Midwest niceness. And thus, herein lies the true irony of this current cultural moment. We crave authenticity, but we lack the foundation to admit that anything we do think or feel is really wrong. I think that in this type of environment, we, the people of Jesus, the church, the practice of confession can be actually one of the most refreshing and yet uncomfortable things that we could do. Confession may be one of the most truly authentic things that we could do in this moment. And so today we're going to dive into the practice of confession and talk a little bit about what it is and why we do it. Uh, if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, you know that we are in a sermon series entitled Teach Us to Pray. Uh, and this sermon series title comes from Luke chapter 11, verse 1, right? We just read it. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, we've noticed something different about the way that you pray. You you pray differently than all the religious elite of this day. So, Lord, teach us how to pray. 
And Jesus answers their question, their command, with arguably one of the most famous prayers in all of history, the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, as we've seen throughout the last several weeks, reveals a few different things about prayer. First, we learn that the Lord's Prayer is not just something that we recite, but it actually is a pattern or a guide for the way in which we pray. It's the place that we go to when we wonder, Jesus, how do I pray? The Lord's Prayer also reveals something very important about the nature of prayer. It shows us that prayer is not simply just communication with God, but it is communion and collaboration with him. Moments of being able to just simply sit in God's presence, to feel his love, to be reminded of who he is and his love for us. Moments to actually collaborate with God. Alex told us several weeks ago, right, we're not merely passive set pieces in a cosmic drama called history. Rather, God's actually created us to be his co-laborers, to join him in the directing, the guiding, the action that occurs on the stage of history to actually work with him to change the world. And finally, the Lord's Prayer reminds us that the essential foundation of Christian prayer is that God is love and he likes us. You can't get through this prayer without realizing that. And it's with that foundation, the foundation of God as love, the who of prayer, we can learn how to confess just as we have learned how to commune, intercede, and petition over the last couple weeks. And so today in week four, we're going to focus on confession or forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who has sinned against us. Uh, First and foremost, before we jump into confession, I want to just take a brief moment to define sin. Because confession and sin are very uh, intertwined concepts, right? But they're also both often misunderstood. Uh, Sin, in the words of St. Ignatius, is an unwillingness to trust that what God wants is our deepest happiness, That what God wants is our deepest happiness. God's desire for us, his creation, has always been a life of beauty, justice, and love. That's what he wants for every single one of us. So it's important to understand that what God deems as sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. It sits at the very opposition of God's desire for you to have a life full of beauty, justice, and love. For example, lead paint isn't banned because lead paint is bad, right? Lead paint is banned because lead paint is bad for you. And it's with that understanding of sin the inability or the unwillingness for us to trust that God wants our deepest happiness, that we can finally shift focus and talk a little bit about what confession is. Confession can be seen throughout the pages of Scripture, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. I want to give several examples here and see if you notice a theme. King David actually writes in Psalm 51 a confession prayer right after he's committed adultery and confessed that to the prophet Nathan. He says in Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In Daniel chapter 9, the prophet Daniel confesses on behalf of himself and the Israelite people, saying, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled. In Mark chapter 1 verse 5, Mark writes that as John the Baptist prepared the way of Jesus, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan. Luke writes in Luke chapter 19 about a man named Zacchaeus who was a tax collector. 
He hears the words of Jesus and immediately confesses of his greed and commits to giving to the poor. Jesus also gives the following parable regarding confession in Luke chapter 19. Picking up in verse 10, it says, Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fight, or sorry, I fast, not fight. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. I'm not that bad. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the tax collector, this man, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is just a little snapshot of all of the examples of confession that we see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Confession in scripture is plentiful and it's normative. And if we're serious about Jesus and our desire to pattern our lives around his, then we must confess as he instructed in his prayer. And that leads us kind of to our main idea for today. If sin is not simply what we have done, but also what we have left undone, then we are all sinners in need of forgiveness, and therefore God does not need our confession, we do. And in order to have a better understanding of confession, we're going to break down this main idea into three manageable parts. So part one, sin is not simply what we have done, but also what we have left undone. For many of us, I think when we hear the word sin, it conjures up images of like stealing a cookie from a cookie jar, right? Uh, or maybe if you grew up in the church and you had like a very well-meaning youth pastor, uh, he may have had like a whole sermon or maybe once a year or several times a year, a sermon on sexual sin. And that's like the first thing that comes to your mind, right? When you think about sin, those are some of the first things that pops into your brain. Right? But when we examine the scriptures, even when we look at what Jesus has to say here in the Lord's Prayer, we begin thinking, huh, I wonder if this construct of sin that I've developed in my mind is different than what Jesus thought about here. Because what Jesus seems to be referencing appears to be much more common, much more everyday. In the gospel, Jesus actually, the gospels, Jesus actually clearly articulates what he believes to be the greatest commandment. And we see this commandment in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all the law and prophets. This is actually where we derive our confession prayer come from. This is what our prayer references when we say, we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Quite simply, sin is not just what we have done, even though there's plenty of that, right? It's also what we have left undone. Very few of us, if we were being really, really honest, have loved God with our whole heart, our whole soul, and our whole mind this week. Very few of us, if we were being really honest, have fully loved our neighbor as ourselves. And thus, could it be that sin's not just simply limited to those big things that you think about, right? But it's much more common, much more every day than we think. Could it be that sin is that decision to stay quiet when your coworker is being treated unfairly? Could it be that sin is that decision not to call you your friend when you know you need to and you know they've been struggling? Could it be that sin is that decision to ignore your neighbor's attempts to say hello because you're to the next appointment? Furthermore, Jesus 
Just as he had some words last week about bread that were not just one-dimensional but two, we see some two-dimensional things happening here with sin. Jesus illustrates this in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount when he says it's not enough to just murder action. We also must not be angry. Attitude. Now hear me out. This is probably the part in the sermon where you're like, oh my gosh, she thinks I'm a horrible person. Every single one of us is a horrible human being. How are we ever going to make it in this world or in this life? How are we ever going to be called worthy right in front of God if sin is really this prevalent and goes this deep into the human heart? Hear me. This is not a call for us to bury our heads in the sand. This is not a call for us to declare everything evil. Equally, we should not hang our heads in defeatism or despair. Rather, the doctrine of sin, what we have left undone and what we have done, not just our actions, our thoughts, our attitudes, our words, although this may seem unjust, cruel, maybe even unbearable, it is one of the most helpful and most freeing diagnoses of the human condition. For in our authenticity, we can come to know that God is good, we are good, but something in this world has gone horribly wrong. And in acceptance of that tension, we can find it easier not to just exist, but to actually hope in a person who's always making it right. More on that later. The sin is not simply what we have done, but also what we have left undone. And number two, we are all sinners in need of forgiveness. You know, this is a, a hard pill to swallow. Not merely because of that not bad, not that bad ideology I talked about earlier, but also because of maybe even some of our own pride. The expectations that we fostered when it comes to church. Many of us approach God the way in which we approach church, coming with our Sunday best. Our biggest smiles, everything's fine, right? C.S. Lewis tells us, though, that we must lay before God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. The disciple John says it this way in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, if we lay before God what is truly in us, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Once we are able to recognize our own status as sinners in need of forgiveness, we are able to shed the religious pride and superiority that so often ensnares us. We're able to shirk the false self that we've created as we walk into church and reveal the true self, all the nasty that's inside there, along with all of the good. Furthermore, in recognizing our status as sinners in need of forgiveness, we have a greater compassion for others. It's so much easier to follow Jesus' command to forgive others as we have been forgiven, right? I'm reminded of the parable of the prodigal son. You know, often we see ourselves in the role of the prodigal or even that of the older brother, right? Both very useful things. But what if we approached the forgiveness of others and ourselves like the running father? What if the aim of that story is for us to not only recognize a running father of forgiveness, but for us to become the running father of forgiveness? See, in our sin, we are all one of the brothers, but in our forgiveness as the forgiven, we have the love and give the love of an embarrassing, doting, unabandoned, running father who has open arms. If sin is not simply what we have done, but what we have left undone, then we are all sinners in need of forgiveness. And number three, God does not need our confession. We do. And here's the good news. 
Before we get to the news, we've got to dispel some fundamental misunderstandings regarding confession. There are a lot of things that we may have learned or that's in the church or we may have misunderstood in regards to the Bible that we've got to correct. First one is this. Confession is not a magical incantation that somehow controls God or forces his mercy to flow. We think it is though, right? Were you ever that kid that went to the altar like every single night because you're like, oh my gosh, if I don't go, I'm not going to be saved, right? That was me. Hear me, confession is not a magical incantation that controls God or forces his mercy. Acts 2.21 is clear that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It does not say if you say the confession prayer five times a day, if you say it at all that you'll be saved, that it is a magic formula. Rather, if you confess Jesus to be Lord, that's it. You're done. Second correction that we need to make. Our admission of sin does not diminish God's grace. Our admission of sin does not diminish God's grace. Second Corinthians 12, 9 says this, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. God's power, his grace, is made even more perfect when you approach him in his weakness, in your weakness. It does not diminish the work of the cross. It actually adds, right, to our own understanding of the cross. Third thing, our prayers do not add to what Jesus accomplished on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19 makes it clear that our faith is in vain apart from Jesus's death and resurrection. Hear me, you are not going to hell because you did not confess of a sin this week. <laughs> Jesus's work on the cross is enough. I will never forget, I uh, went to a pretty traditional church growing up. It was wonderful. I had some incredible life-changing experiences there. But, you know, along the way, it was a mixed bag, and I learned some uh, theological whoopsies, okay? One of those, we had a guest speaker one time uh, who came to our Sunday school class, our kids' Sunday school class, which now that I think about it, that's really impressive. Uh, and I kid you not, this guest speaker had a whole teaching on how if we did not immediately say sorry for things that we had done, we were going to hell. Serious. I'm like, I think I'm like 10 years old, okay? Yeah, real tough. It's real tough. I walked away from that thinking like, oh dear God, what am I going to do, right? As much as we laugh at that, I think that's probably a lot of your experiences. And you really need to hear me when I say that your confession does not add anything to the cross. Nothing. In fact, it's a pretty arrogant strain of humanity to think that somehow we could add to what Jesus did on this cross, right? Fourth, last correction we need to make. Our prayers never add to God's knowledge. His knowledge is already complete. I think some of us think that in confessing and like coming up with what we've done wrong, we're somehow like informing God like he doesn't already know. Uh, Jesus actually demonstrates this all-knowing knowledge. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, uh, we see this story unfold. Some Pharisees are walking around pretty annoyed with Jesus. He's been going around saying things like, I am the Son of God, and I forgive you of your sins. And they're sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, you blasphemer. How dare you? They begin grumbling behind his back, not to his face, behind his back. And it says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, that Jesus knew their thoughts and asked them, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? God already knows everything about you, everything you've ever done, every thought you've ever had, your ins, your outs, the good, the bad, we don't add to God's knowledge by confessing. So if confession is not the things that I just said, right, what is it and why do we do it? 
The Greek word for confess means to say the same thing. It actually reveals to us a lot about what confession is and what it means. Confession is, in its base form, merely admitting to God what he already knows about us. And thus, God does not need our confession. We need it. Confession's not for God's benefit. It's actually for our own. Confession should grow in us a God-likeness, a revealing of his character. Many come to me often and ask the question, how do I become more like Jesus? Simple answer, confession. It's a great place to start. Because in confession, we're actually forced to acknowledge where we are unlike God, and we are forced to see where we need to become more like God. So sin is not simply what we've done, but also what we have left undone. Then we are all sinners in need of forgiveness, but good news, confession is the thing, right, that helps us look more like him. Confession is not for God, it's for the own formation of our hearts. Worship team, if you would join me. I think probably one of the biggest temptations when leaving a sermon like this is feeling like I did when I was that 10-year-old kid, like, I'm never going to be able to do anything right. Like, everything I do is wrong. Like, if sin is this prevalent in the world and in my heart, in my life, like, man, I've got a long way to go. Hear my heart, though. That is not God's desire, nor is it mine. That's actually the desire of the enemy, the father of lies. Confession is not meant to bring about condemnation. It's not meant to bring about guilt. It's meant to bring about change. It's like that potter, right, that we see in scripture that's slowly molding the clay into a sculpture. Confession is the potter's hands. It's helping us become more and more like him. N.T. Wright, when he writes about this particular passage in scripture and talks about confession, he talks about the problem of the perpetual prodigal son. I think a lot of us have become perpetual prodigal sons. We're so stuck in our literal mud, in our weakness, in our sin. We can't even envision what it would be like to crawl back to God. And when we do, we assume we're going to be met with somebody who's really stern, who keeps a record of wrongs who's indifferent to our coming home. But when we read scripture, when we even look at this story, we find something very different. The prodigal is returning home to his father. It says that the father is sitting there like waiting at the window looking for him, which is honestly bizarre because the son at this point has basically said, I wish you were dead taken all of his money and said, I will never see you again. Peace out. And despite all of that hurt and pain that the father must be feeling in that moment, he looks out the window, ready for that son to come home. As the son saunters towards the house, just hoping maybe he could be a servant for his father, like so many of us, expecting a really stern God, he sees somebody running which in Jewish culture was unheard of. Running was something that like the lowliest did, not somebody who was an elite. Sees somebody running and he goes, is that my father? What disgrace. No one of his status in his right mind would do anything like that. Father's running, he doesn't even need an explanation. He doesn't even ask him where he's been or what he's done or why he's here. He just opens his arms and he gives him the biggest bear hug. I think that we need to approach the forgiveness of ourselves 
and others like that of a running father. In sin, yes, we are all one of the brothers in this story. But in our forgiveness, as the forgiven people of God, we have the love and give the love of that loving, embarrassing, doting, running father. So the question is, how do we regularly practice confession? So we know we need to do it in the forming of our own heart. How do we do that, right? We end every service with a spiritual practice. And as we've been going through this series, we've given a spiritual practice or a guidance on how to do each part of the Lord's Prayer. So briefly, I'm going to recap those, and then I'm going to tell you what that instruction for confession is. But notice as I do this, Jesus formulated this prayer in a very specific way. He started with our Father. He didn't start with beg for forgiveness or confess your sins. He started with our Father. Hallowed be your name. When we approach God, we begin with contemplative prayer. We spend five minutes just asking to receive the love of God, to be reminded of what that's supposed to look like, to drink it in, to reject all of the people that have told us we're nothing, those bad examples of love, and to be in his presence, focusing on his love for us. Then your kingdom come interceding for those around us, referring to a list of those that you're intentionally praying for, asking God for their needs, knowing that you're partnering with him in changing the history of this world. Then we pray, give us each day our daily bread. We begin asking him, petitioning him for our own needs. We're not afraid to bring our deepest, even our most selfish desires before God because he wants to hear them. He wants to order them. He even wants to answer them. And then finally, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. We confess. We take several moments to just reflect on our actions from that past week. Not looking for every single thing that we've done wrong, but asking God to bring to light places where we've been unlike him. We need to be shaped and formed once again, just like a potter taking his hands to a piece of clay. And after several moments of reflecting, I think it's helpful to recite the confession prayer. So if you would with me, we're going to do just that today. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, taking a deep breath, asking Jesus to just bring to mind moments where you could have or should have been more like him.
loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will listening to the Midtown Church Weekly Podcast. To find out more or to join a church gathering, check out our website at midtownkc.church.